but for now, uh, let me introduce uh, Meng Stephanie Shen, who is at Cal State Fullerton. And she's going to be talking to us about tuning electrostatic mediated self-assembly beyond the classical theory. So Stephanie, the floor is yours. Hi, uh, thank you, Sonia, uh, Sonia, for the kind introduction. Uh, my name is Meng Shen and I'm an assistant professor at California State University at Fullerton. Today, I'm gonna talk about our computational work on tuning electrostatic mediated self-assembly beyond the classical theory. Uh, I would like to thank Wally for inviting me and for BPPB for giving me the opportunity to prevent, uh, present my work to the audience here. Um, first of all, please allow me to introduce our uh, department at California State University at Fullerton, short for CSUF. CSUF is a pub pub public university with both undergraduate and uh, master programs. Uh, our department uh, uh, is physics department, and we have several research directions, including gravitational wave and astronomy, soft matter physics and biophysics, condensed matter physics, and physics education and quantum physics. Uh, we, especially in the field of soft matter physics and biophysics, we, um, uh, we have recently uh, uh, have uh, uh, three uh, new faculty members joining the department in the past few years, including myself, and the research is vibrant in this field. And we established collaboration nationwide and in campus, on campus. Uh, my main research interest is to develop and use computational methods to understand the soft materials. As Ronit was uh, showing a lot, uh, soft materials, including bio materials, uh, have a very complicated structure and a lot of times they're hierarchical. Um, so there is a trade-off between the efficiency and accuracy of computational models. Therefore, choosing the most suitable computational method is the key to understand the mechanisms. Uh, for example, in the first figure here, I was trying to understand the heat transfer mechanisms across the interface between um, carbon nanotubes. In this case, uh, atomic vibration is important for the mechanism. Therefore, we choose to use atomistic simulations. On the other hand, uh, when, when we try to understand the self-assembly of colloidal nanoparticles, uh, the key mechanisms happen at the 10 nanometer to 100 nanometer length scales. Therefore, we choose to use coarse grained simulations. In my recent research, I was trying to design mechanical metamaterials. We choose to use uh, system level network models because the key mechanism happened at the macroscopic level. In this talk, I um, will focus on the uh, electrostatic mediated self-assembly. Um, and therefore, we choose to use uh, coarse grained simulations. First of all, why, we are, why are we interested in electrostatics? Electrostatics provides a lot of tuning parameters for self-assembly. For example, applying an electric field will lead to the formation of one dimensional conductive chains. And another example is charging colloidal particles will lead to formation of colloidal molecules. And electrostatics is indeed very important for bio biophysics. For example, adding salt to the gamma gliadin droplets will lead to uh, the liquid liquid phase separation of proteins. So this example shows that adding salt or ions uh, provides an important tuning parameter for self-assembly or self-separation in soft matter systems. It is always a good idea to refer to any available analytical model for the, for the tuning process. And here I show a fundamental physical picture for the classical theory. Essentially what we have is two uh, coll charged colloidal particles in a sea of ions here. And uh, the question is, what is the effective interaction between the two colloidal particles? According to the classical de Bayhuckel theory, the interaction between the two colloidal particles is the Coulombic interaction, the first term here, screened by a exponential decay, the second term here. And the lambda d is the decay lens. Graphically, if the interaction energy for the colloidal particles in a salt-free dielectric medium is one over r, where uh, r is the distance between the particles, then the interaction between the particles in a 
high salt concentration would decay much faster due to the exponential decay. And according to the Debye Huckel theory, this decay length is actually decreasing with the salt concentration. In particular, the decay length is inversely proportional to the square root of the concentration. Although the Debye Huckel theory is quite successful at low salt concentrations, it's not necessarily working well for high salt concentrations. In a recent experiment by a, a Perkin group, it was shown that the Debye lens, the decay lens, it is even uh, increasing with the salt concentration. And this is an anomalous behavior uh, comparing with the classical theory here. And we really want to understand it. To understand the, so the discrepancy between the theory and the experimental observations, it is important to look at what is approximated in the classical theory. There are two essential approximations here. First of all, this very elegant exponential decay is actually derived from a mean field approximation. And mean field approximation uh, actually indicates uh, a neglect of the ionic correlation. Which, which can be very important for high salt concentrations. And second, the uh, debye huckel theory assumes that the dielectric constant or permittivity epsilon r is a uniform, is a constant value throughout the space, which is uh, again, not necessarily true here. Now we're ready to look at uh, what is missing in the classical theories. First of all, uh, the first uh, missing effect is the ionic correlation. Uh, again, the mean field theory uh, uh, neglects all the ionic correlation. However, in reality, the ions are not just randomly distributed in space. The ionic distribution and ionic correlation depends on the complicated interaction, uh, short range and long range between the ions. And second, um, the second missing effect in the classical theory is the dielectric heterogeneity. We see in reality, for example, if we have phase, uh, liquid, liquid phase separation uh, for, for proteins, um, so we do have different regions with different dielectric constant, and that will lead to a dielectric uh, heterogeneity. In this talk, we would like to address these two missing effects one after another, one by one. So first of all, we would like to focus on the effect of ionic correlation. So here's the experimental system that we choose uh, to understand the system. In, in a recent experiment, it was shown that highly charged uh, nanoparticles in very dilute salt solutions show that the particles are well dispersed in the solution and uh, indicating a repulsive interaction between uh, the, part, uh, the ch likely charged colloidal particles. However, when at very high salt concentration, the samely charged uh, nanoparticles start to form a crystal. Um, so the equilibrium distance between the colloidal particles is much shorter than that in the dilute solution. This actually indicates a cohesive interaction between the likely charged colloidal particles. And this is never uh, predicted by the debye huckel theory because according to the debye huckel theory, if the colloidal particles are likely charged, they always have repulsion with respect to each other. To understand this anomalous behavior, we use coarse grain simulations. Um, we explicitly model the nanoparticles and the ions. The big spheres are the nanoparticles and the small dots are ions. And we implicitly model the solvent water. Uh, one of the biggest challenges in coarse grain simulations is to correctly model the ionic correlation because um, the solvent molecules are mo not modeled e explicitly here. However, it is quite, um, it is much easier to obtain the ionic correlation in at atomistic simulations. We quantify the ionic correlation by the radio distribution function uh, or G of R. G of R um, quantifies the probability of finding one ion from certain distance from the other ion. And our strategy here is to develop a tabulated force field between the ions by mapping the radio distribution function in coarse grain simulations with the G of R in the atom atomic simulations. Here's the algorithm we, we choose to uh, develop the force field. 
first of all, we calculate the radio distribution function from the at atomic simulation. We, and then second, we guess the initial ionic potential for the coarse grain simulations. And then we use the algorithm of Boltzmann inversion to correct the potential ionic potential in coarse grain simulations using this equation over here. Uh, so G, uh, GI of R is the radio distribution function in coarse grain simulation and GS is the radio distribution function for the atomic simulation. So we correct the potential with the second term over here. And we can see that after about seven iterations, uh, we already managed to, uh, for the uh, G of R to converge from the coarse grain simulation with, uh, to the atomic simulations. Now we're ready to see the results. Uh, we start from the neutral particles. We see that, uh, so here we show the mean force between the particles as a function of distance between the colloidal particles. The red one is a low concentration and the blue one is higher concentration. It is very interesting that even if the nanoparticles are not charged, we still see an attractive interaction between them. Uh, and we understand this attractive interaction by the depletion force. Um, so if you're not familiar with depletion force, when the two colloidal particles are close to each other, then the probability for the ions to collide with the particles from outside the particles would be much larger than the probability for the ions to collide with the, part, uh, the nanoparticles from in between the nanoparticles. And that will lead to a effective uh, force, that, uh, that attractive force, which is called the depletion force. And we can see this force is only effective when the particles are close to each other. Therefore, it's a short range interaction. And now if we look at the interaction energy uh, as a function of distance, we indeed, we see a attractive well at a close distance between the particles. Now we charge the nanoparticles and now we see an electrostatic repulsion that is qualitatively consistent with the classical theory. What is really interesting is when we highly charge the nanoparticles, we see the reentrance of the attractive well. And this attractive well is no longer explained by the depletion force because this is at a much uh, larger distance comparing with the neutral particle case. To understand that, we analyze the ion distribution and we notice that ions do aggregate at the particle surfaces. So our explanation is that the ions will uh, have a fluctuate, the ion density have a um, fluctuating density between the nanoparticles. And this fluctuating charge density leads to an effective attractive interaction between the nanoparticles that is at a much larger, larger range. Um, but still it's uh, at a shorter range comparing with a dilute solution. And this is consistent with the experimental observation. So in the second part of the talk, I would like to focus on the second missing effect, the dielectric heterogeneity. So again, we choose the experimental model system. In recent experiments, it was found that um, rare earth ions will form clusters in the metal uh, amphiphilic solution. A closer analysis uh, reveals that the, uh, the, the rare earth ion, in particular uranium ion in this case, is wrapped together with its um, um, counter ions in the water droplet. And this neutral water droplet in turn will form clusters. And the clustering of the water droplets indicates a attractive interaction between the wa water droplets. And so this system includes water droplets and oil medium. And, and we, we have the dielectric heterogeneity here. The question here is, what is the contribution of the dielectric heterogeneity to this attractive interaction between the droplets? So our model system looks like this. We have uh, water droplets including uh, uh, that encode the ions here. Um, so again, we model the ions explicitly. Ions are small dots over here. The big spheres are the water droplets. We model water, uh, both water and oil uh, dielectric medium as uh, implicitly. So the model is slightly different from the previous model, and let's show you why. Um, first of all, let's look at the, what is the theoretical picture of the dielectric heterogeneity. So in this uh, illustration here, we have two regions, 
epsilon with dielectric constant epsilon one and epsilon two. When we introduce charges into the system, we start to have surface polarization. The molecules at the boundary between the two dielectric medium will start to polarize. So theoretically, we start from the Gauss's law, uh, the divergence of the product of the dielectric constant and the gradient of the electric potential is equal to the negative of the free charge. If we have a homogeneous dielectric medium, um, the question becomes simple. We simply replace this um, uh, divergence with the Laplacian of the electric potential here. However, when we, we start, to start to have dielectric uh, heterogeneity, then we have to consider the gradient of the dielectric constant as well. And this first bolded term is associated with the interfacial polarization um, that is associated with the interfacial polarization vector P. The bad news is it's not very convenient to deal with the uh, polarization vector uh, directly. And fortunately, we can introduce the, uh, uh, the interfacial polarization charge omega, omega here. When we have the interfacial induced charge or polarization charge omega, we can easily separate the uh, electrostatic potential into the contribution from the real charges and the contribution from uh, the induced charges. And we can use the simple Green's formula, one over R to represent the electrostatic potential. Computationally, we developed a um, uh, energy functional I of omega over the years, and then we incorporate into it into our coarse grain model. So essentially we, uh, here's the flow chart of how we um, update the, si the simulation. First of all, we initiate initialize the uh, charge configuration of the real charges. Then we minimize the energy functional to find the induced charges. And then we update the forces on the real charges and we move the real charges using molecular dynamics and we iterate this process. So this is indeed a hybrid method. We minimize the fun energy functional to find the uh, induced charges. And then we use molecular dynamics to update the velocity and position of the real charges. And now let's uh, look at uh, the evolution of the real charges and induced charges during this course during the simulation. The red, uh, the, uh, the red small dot is the cation. The uh, blue, blue uh, red dot, uh, red, the blue small dots are the anions, and the big spheres are the uh, water droplets. And this coloration on the surface of the droplets are the induced charges. So if we look at the evolution of the simulation, we can see that the positive ions always induce positive induced charges and the negative uh, ions always induce negative induced charges at the boundary between the two dielectric medium. And uh, remember our goal is to understand how the surface polarization or the dielectric heterogeneity affects the attractive interaction. So with the induced charges, we're able to separate the uh, induced charge contribution from the charge charge contribution. We separate the interaction energy into the ion ion contribution or charge charge contribution and the um, ion induced charge contribution or the charge induced charge contribution. We would like to see how this red term contributes to the interaction energy between the two um, droplets. So, the, so here's the result of the interaction energy between the droplets as a function of distance. We see that the black curve is the total interaction. Indeed, we see a um, attractive interaction and that mimics the uh, dispersion interaction between the droplets. Uh, it uh, decays with R to the power of nine and negative six. Uh, the red curve is the charge, the ion induced charge interaction, and the blue curve is the ion ion interaction. What is surprising and interesting here is the ion induced charge interaction actually makes the major contribution to the total interaction energy here. So, and that's um, so that indicates that neglecting the dielectric heterogeneity will significantly. Um, underestimate the attractive interaction between the droplets. So, so this is summary of the two model systems 
in the first system, we have uh, nanoparticles in a sea of ions um, in water uh, solvent here. And uh, so in using this model, we are able to account for the missing ionic correlation effect in the classical theory. In the second, uh, in the second model, we have ion-containing droplets in a sea of ion uh, in a sea of oil uh, dielectric medium, and using this model, we are able to capture the dielectric uh, heterogeneity that is again neglected in the classical theory. So, as a summary, we see that coarse grained simulations is indeed effective to account for the missing effects in the classical theory for the self assembly process. Um, and the uh, coarse grain simulations with implicit solvent um, and correct ionic correlation capture the effects of the both the de depletion effects and ionic correlation. And uh, second, the hybrid um, continuum particle based simulations um, allows us to account for the um, um, heterogeneity, uh, dielectric heterogeneity, and the surface polarization effects. In the end, I would like to thank all my uh, group members and uh, current, so all my collaborators for this research and my current group members that uh, 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 supports my, my new research directions. And thank you for attending the talk. Thank you so much for a really wonderful talk. Um, questions? So I, I can start with one. Um, could you say a little bit more about the rare earth flocculation process, sort of when, when that might actually occur, either you know, naturally or maybe in a you know, um, production process, and also whether there's a phase transition behavior going on there with the rare earth um, concentration as a control parameter or something like that? Um, yeah, uh, what happens in experiments is they added uh, amphiphilic surfactants in oil and uh, as, as well, like the water contain, uh, the oil contains a little bit of water content and that's allow uh, uh, the ion to be encapsulated in the, in the droplets. And then, um, so with those uh, amphiphilic uh, surfactants, so we're able to extract um, uh, um, uh, the rare earth ions from it, yes. So surfactants are, yeah, necessary for this process. Yeah, but in our model, we simplify it to just to understand one aspect of the physics, yeah. Right. Um, and as the concentration of the rare earth changes, would there be, you know, an increasing tendency toward flocculation? Um, oh, that's, that's, that's a great question, yeah. Um, so I, I think the um, um, so so there there must be an effect over there and um, um, so there are two two effects concentration of uh, of the ions will lead to like more screening effects um, so on the other hand so it's it's different from uh, uh, the colloidal particles in a sea of ions. So here the ion itself is the, the subject of the, uh, of the clustering. Um, and so the process is really complicated and we're actually, uh, um, this is under our invest investigation, yes. Okay, thanks. Um, thank you, for, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, oops, muting myself there. Uh, so it looks like we have a couple of other questions in the chat. Um, there is, uh, one uh, starting from Wiley. Uh, do you want to unmute and ask, or should I read it? Um, sure, I can ask. Um, so these, the results that you showed seem like they would play a role in a lot of like self-assembly processes that people have studied um, in the past. Um, can you, do you know of any cases, or can you think of any cases where um, the results that you explained here would explain maybe some of the weird things that they've seen, or maybe some of the self-assembly that they didn't expect to see? Oh yeah. Um, so, for example, uh, so in this rare earth uh, extraction case, uh, uh, so so this is the experimental system that we uh, uh, we choose to to model uh, this uh, this the second effect. So, without the interfacial polarization, uh, the ion ion interaction itself is just not enough to form this clustering. So, indeed, it's necessary to include this uh, 
um, the, the surface polarization. So on the other, so for the other missing effects as well. So if we only use the debye huckle theory, so definitely we just uh, observe the repulsive interaction and ionic correlation at soil concentration is really, really important. And ionic correlation is also very important for uh, the, the, the region that are close to the highly charged surfaces. Yes, yeah. And definitely there are more cases like highly charged DNA that Ronit has been talking about, yeah. Okay, yeah, that was kind of my, my that was part of my question because it seems like, it seems like you could pop up a lot of places, I guess that maybe people aren't necessarily it's thinking about. It's a huge problem working with, uh, you know, between experimenters and computationalists. As experimenters, we work with high salts, different salts, different ions. They play a huge role in the self-assembly. So Meg's work in this case is very relevant. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ronan. And thank you, Wiley. Yeah. I see a question in the chat. Yeah, uh, yeah. thank you, uh, Mike. Uh, that's a great, great question. So um, what, uh, what, what is happening in the theoretical development is we start to introduce the um, um, so how do you say it? the density functional theory, not the quantum mechanical density functional theory, but the classical density functional theory to incorporate the ionic correlation to the mean field of approximation and such that we just uh, uh, move back the, the, the missing uh, or neglect effect in the, in the classical theory. Um, the problem is it's um, it's still a numerical method. It's theoretical theoretical to begin with, but it's still numerical in the end. Uh, it's really, really difficult to question from the theoretical field, yes. We, we wish we can develop an elegant um, uh, equation here. So like you, yeah. Um, so let's see, what other uh, other questions? people have. Um, and since we have a little bit of time before the top of the hour, also, if you have other questions for Ronek, feel free to uh, to jump in. Um, let's see, well, if not, I guess let me, let's uh, thank both speakers again officially very, very much. Um, and last call for questions on the record, and then I'll turn off the recording and we can chat more informally. Uh, if people maybe have questions they don't, they don't want to be uh, put up on the YouTube channel. Um, uh, yeah, I can ask. <laughs> okay, go, go for it. <laughs> uh, so, Meng, um, when I heard uh, you guys talk about the desert fashion way, so I have some thought, I just you know uh, maybe chat with you. Um, so, you know, uh, in classical uh, density function theory, for example, when we talk about liquid, right? So you can always get a, a function, you can uh, do some perturbation then to uh, truncate, uh, like uh, people do the Perkyavik theory, right? And also um, uh, there are some related. So I wonder if, you know, in that case, you might be able, uh, you know, truncate it to some closure relation, then um, perform a certain uh, quasi analytical, like semi analytical, or uh, analysis. Yeah, that's a, that's a really really good suggestion. Yeah, for example, uh, if we do a spherical harmonic uh, approximation, we can extract like dipolar, uh, multipolar, quadrupolar uh, effects, and that can uh, really help us give some insights from uh, the you know uh, the ionic correlation uh, effects over there. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a that's a very good suggestion. Yeah, thank you. See, well, uh, I'm going to turn off the recording and we can talk more informally for a little while. Um.